So you might want to know what's in the fracking fluid. Water and sand, primary ingredients. It only works if that sand and water are all mixed up together. You can't let the sand settle out. So you need some emulsifier. You need something that <coughs> keeps it all in solution. A typical one is some kind of agar gum, the kind of stuff they put in to th thicken toothpaste. You also are going to need to add salt because you don't want a lot of these other chemicals that you've added to there to break down very easily. You want it to exist in this pressurized system and, and have it stay mixed. You can't let it freeze. You need it to flow smoothly. So the list of chemicals, which we've illustrated here, are added to fracking water. Maybe a half of 1% of the fluid are these things. Now, you do not want to drink this fluid. And clearly, when you pull it back out of the ground, whatever oil and hydrocarbons and other types of easily removable things that were in the hydrocarbons themselves are now dissolved in the water as well. So when this fracking fluid comes back up, you need to dispose of it properly. Keep in mind, though, that this fracking fluid only comes from when you are actually fracking the well. The wells have to be fracked over again sometimes. It takes about 3 million gallons of water, of this fluid, to frack a well over its lifetime. 3 million gallons. Whenever we use a word like million, people say, oh my gosh, that's so much. I think we're thinking about dollars. 3 million gallons is about the size of four Olympic swimming pools. Yeah, that's a lot of water. But we need to compare that amount of water to other water usages. What we've done is we've basically taken this big pipe for seven miles and filled it up. And then we empty it out. So if I compare that amount of water, we should really compare it to other human usage. Not industrial usage, but just for humans. In America, the average water use is about 100 gallons per day per person. I remember hearing that long ago and thinking, what? That's crazy. I don't drink 100 gallons a day. No, you don't have to drink the water. Think about the water that's on in the shower. Think about the water that's on to have cleaned the clothes you wore that day. What about the water that's flushed away in the toilets or in the sink? Add all that up, 100 gallons. So the 3 million gallons for doing the well, well, that would be 30,000 people for one day's use. So fracking one well takes 3 million gallons of water. There are 35,000 wells in the United States, so that's about 100 billion gallons total. Of course, compared to human use of 100 gallons per day per person, multiply that out and you find that fracking uses less than 1% of the water that's used through normal daily consumption. Not saying that's not a lot of water, but a city like Champaign-Urbana, just Champaign-Urbana, 100,000 people plus the students, maybe 150,000 altogether, we use 5 billion gallons a year. 5 billion with a B, 10 to the 9th. 20 cities this size in one year use the same amount of water as all the fracking across the entire country. Does it use water? Sure. Is this a huge drain on our general resources? No. Now, some locations, keep in mind, are very scarce in fresh water. And when you need to frack those areas and you bring in all these fluids, people say, oh my gosh, that's stuff that could go to our crops or go to this instead. Instead, we're doing it to produce oil and gas. Probably are the same people that use the oil and gas. But still, you can see in local areas people complaining about the water. So something is being done. If you can reuse that water, clean it up a bit, use the same water for another gas and oil well, all the better. If you can use not fresh water, but salt water, after all, one of the things you're adding to it is going to be salt, that's even better too. Or maybe use water right from the river, not water you drink anyway, 
but water that you could use probably for agriculture, but at least it wouldn't be the pure crystal drinking water coming from your city's water supply. In worrying about pollution from fracking, one of the original sources of problems that were detected is what do you do with this water when you take it out? If it was done improperly, if it was just dumped into a stream or sprayed out onto the ground, that would be very bad. And indeed, some places where that occurred, those companies have been fined, inspections have been done, the operations have been shut down. When fracking first started, there was this huge growth. And because of that huge growth, the number of inspectors, the regulations, could not keep up. But we now have caught up. And so the number of instances of where fracking is being done, say, environmentally poorly, where the water is not being treated, not being taken care of, where steps have not been taken to allow that fracked water not to go back into the water's table, are very rare at this point. And when they do occur, those places are investigated, fined, and forced to clean up. So in places where water is tight, where there is not a lot of excess resource, even though on a whole, less than 1% of our personal water use supply goes towards doing this hydraulic fracturing, in some locations, that water isn't as readily available. So especially in those locations, industry has found ways to use less water. Due to public concerns about the high volume of water used in fracking, oil and gas drilling companies have started reusing and recycling the wastewater. The natural gas industry uses a number of methods to recycle drilling waste. Some drillers have used recycled equipment at the well site or trucked the water to a recycling facility where the wastewater is filtered, evaporated, and then distilled to be used again at the well. Other companies add fresh water to the wastewater to dilute the salts and other contaminants before pumping it back in the ground for more hydrofracking. Some of it is sold for use as dust suppression or to melt ice on roads because the brine wastewater tends to be extremely salty. Any fracking sludge that settles from these various processes is taken to landfills or sent to injection disposal wells. So these are some of the techniques being used and there are even some more fancy techniques. One idea is to use natural gas itself as the fracking fluid. You'd have to cryogenically cool it, turn it into a liquid, put it under high pressure, suspend things in it, but then that's wonderful because in the end, that's the gas you're trying to get out, right? So there is no water in a pond. It, you just sell the stuff that you pump down there. So there are ways to be able to do this, uh, and those ways are, are coming up. If the price goes back up, more ways will be developed. In the end, it comes down to economics. Some people say, my water's on fire. That when I, water comes out of the tap, it's got methane in it and I can light a match to it and the water catches on fire itself. Don't drink that water. In fact, don't use that water in your house. In these cases, it has nothing to do with fracking. Some places, there are methane deposits near the water table. And when you pull your water out, it has methane in it. Just today in class, one of the students said, yeah, our water is always on fire. There's no fracking well anywhere near her house or anywhere near probably in the whole county. People have had methane in their water without anything to do with fracking. Here's a map of where the fracking fields are in the United States, where these shale formations are. And the darker the color on the map, the more gas is contained here. And you can see that the state of Pennsylvania and the state of Texas are covered in possible shale formations. Indeed, those are the two states in the United States that lead the shale production of gas and oil. North Dakota also has quite a large area, and much of the area up there, the fracking that's done there, produces oil, not gas. Here is a graph of gross withdrawal of shale gas by state. And you can see that Texas and Pennsylvania dominate over the rest of the United States altogether. These are the places the gas is found. 
and at this point has been developed. So how much gas is that? Before this fracking boom, it was estimated there were 245 quads of recoverable natural gas in the United States. It's only about 10 years supply. With fracking, this number has gone up tremendously. Proven reserves now may be in the 355 quads, but estimated reserves 420 to 1,000 quads. Since we're using about 25 quads a year, that could be a next 40 year supply of relatively inexpensive natural gas. There's another concern about fracking. Remember that giant explosion underground to make all those holes in the pipe and fracture the rock that you could hear on the seismograph? It's been shown that in areas that have had a lot of fracking, there are more earth tremors that occur. Not while someone's blowing it up, but in between periods. You can measure these micro earthquakes. At first, this sounds terribly scary. Oh my God, you're making the earth unstable. You're gonna have earthquakes all over. Everything's gonna tumble and fall. Well, let's think for a moment. A devastating earthquake is one of a very high magnitude. Earthquakes occur because you have movement of tectonic plates. You have two land masses trying to move past one another and they get stuck on each other. They get stuck, they won't move. Pressure builds up, pressure builds up. They're trying to move, they're trying to move, they're trying to move. And then finally, there's a huge shift and there goes San Francisco. How would you prevent that? How could you imagine a way such that the big one doesn't occur. Well, maybe instead of waiting for that one fault line to develop so much pressure, you could just relieve it a little bit. Let it have a little micro earthquake. Let it move just a little bit and just another little bit. Not enough that you can even feel, let alone shake a building. Measurements can measure it. Micro earthquakes. So it could well be that enough of these micro earthquakes are a good thing because they prevent some huge earthquake, some huge slippage of fault lines from occurring sometime in the future. Geologists will probably have to look at this for quite some time, but on the face of it, hydraulic fracturing can be done safely and is being done safely. Since half of the oil supply being pumped out of the ground, half of the natural gas supply is being obtained in this manner in the United States. Increased energy use means better standard of living. And for many of the billions of people in the underdeveloped world, having more safe energy systems are important. It leads to more electricity, more refrigeration, more opportunities for the people. Producing an energy supply in a clean, safe manner is the same thing as saying, I want the other people in the world to be able to enjoy a higher standard of living themselves, have a higher life expectancy, be more productive in their careers, in their paths, in their ability to feed their families. So energy use is not just, oh, we want to make sure America has enough. We want to make sure the world has enough. So making safe energy sources is very important. I do research in nuclear systems and in solar systems. And those are great energy sources, which will be discussed at various times in this class. Fossil fuels, however, dominate our energy landscape. 80% of the energy comes from fossil fuels across the world. So we better learn how to make fossil fuels available and inexpensive and clean. Since natural gas produces less CO2 than any other fossil fuel per energy unit, finding ways to get it out of the ground in an economical and safe manner become very important. And that's why understanding what hydraulic fracturing is and what it isn't is also very important. Should you be concerned about it? Sure. The same amount of concern you should be about any type of oil well, in, oil well or gas well or coal formation. Using fossil fuels is messy and you need to make sure to do it right. 
But fracking is no different than those in that it's just one more thing that you need to watch for, regulate, control, inspect. Inherently, it has no more dangers and has been done for just as long as many of the other types of oil and gas extraction techniques. That's what you need to know about hydraulic fracturing.